It is essential to understand that battles are primarily won in the hearts of men. Men respond to leadership in a most remarkable way. And once you have won his heart, he will follow you anywhere, wins Lombardi. On that note, may I request Ms. Tessie Thomas, faculty member, Department of English, to introduce the keynote speaker for the day. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, everybody. I consider it my privilege to introduce the keynote speaker for the day, Dr. A. Ravindra, former Chief Secretary, Government of Karnataka. Dr. Ravindra joined the Indian Administrative Service in 1965 and served in various capacities in government, such as Deputy Commissioner, Secretary to Government, Commissioner, Commercial Taxes, Managing Director, Karnataka Power Corporation, Chairman and Managing Director, Industrial and Investment Development Corporation, Commissioner, Bangor City Corporation, and Chairman, BDA, before retiring as Chief Secretary to Government of Karnataka at the end of 2002. He holds a PhD degree in development studies and is specialized in the urban sector. He was responsible for introducing several governance reforms such as rationalizing property tax system through the self-assessment scheme which became quite popular in Bangalore. He was instrumental in initiating the Kaveri Water Supply Scheme Stage 4 and the Bangalore Metro Rail Project. He played a pioneer role in promoting civic awareness among citizens through Swapamana, a platform of resident welfare associations, NGOs, and civic agencies like BBMP and BDA. He has served on various committees for reforms in housing and urban development sectors at the state and national levels. After retirement, he served as Deputy Chairman, Karnataka State Planning Board, Senior Visiting Faculty at IIM Bangalore, and Advisor to Chief Minister of Karnataka. Currently, he heads the Center for Sustainable Development, a non-profit organization working on sustainability issues. He has published several papers and articles on urban and public policy issues. His books include Metropolitan Bangalore, A Management Perspective, Urban Land Policy, Dance of Democracy, and a Coffee Table Book on Bangalore. His monograph on Kaveri Water Dispute, A Bend in the Kaveri, is released re recently. On this note, I would like to welcome Dr. A. Ravindra for the keynote address. Dr. Sundar Rajan, Vice Chancellor, Dr. Sandeep Shastri, Pro Chancellor, other distinguished uh, guests on the dais, and friends. At the outset, uh, let me say how grateful I am for uh, inviting me to this very important conference. Uh, I would also like to express my appreciation for the excellent manner in which Jain University is imparting education. Dr. Sundar Rajan <laughs> provided a lot of uh, details, a uh, vast network, 10,000 students. And I think in terms of quality education, which is very rare these days, I think uh, Jain University is playing a very significant role. So let me congratulate the Vice Chancellor and his entire team, the faculty, for uh, <coughs> uh, you know, venturing on such a noble task of uh, providing good quality education, which is very much related to today's topic of uh, <coughs> demographic, uh, demographics. <coughs> well, I must uh, confess at the outset that I am not an expert in this field, but uh, sometimes, you know, you, people think that uh, some persons can speak on anything, which is, uh, <laughs> especially in India, you know, it's, uh, I belong to that category called generalists. You know, you know, this generalist, specialist and all that. So generalists can dabble in anything and uh, pretend to be experts, but they are not necessarily so. Anyway, I'll, uh, I thought this is a good opportunity to learn something about demographics. <coughs> well, as you know, demography or population all over the world and India has been increasing, and we are witnessing a lot of demographic change. The world is more than 7 billion population as we know now. <coughs> and India has been experiencing a very important demographic changes over the last so many decades. Uh, if you just look at this uh, <coughs> graph, you will see how 
the population has been growing. We, we now stand at about 1.2 billion was the population in 2011 census. As of today, I believe the population of India is 1.32 billion, 2016, that is the latest count. Whereas China is a population of 1.38 billion. So very soon we are going to catch up with China and have the distinction of being the largest, not only the largest democracy in the world, we, keep, we take pride in saying that, but the largest, most populous nation in the world whether we would like the distinction or not, that, that, is, that is so. But what is uh, interesting is that, you know, if you see the graph, you'll, the population has been rising and it will rise up to 2030, 2050 when we will reach the peak. And then, uh, then it will start declining the rate of growth. So we will find the pace of population growth, which is 2% uh, earlier, has now come down to about 1.5%. Uh, <coughs> Another so <coughs> important aspect relating to demography is the question of working age population. You know, the working age population is said to be in the age group of 15 to 59, and that has now reached the peak, it is about 65 percent. And it will be in that level, I mean, it will be at the peak for some more couple of decades, and then again it will start coming down. In the age group of 0 to 14, the population again is declining. So this is important to know, the child population will decrease. And now it is about 30 percent and it will come down to 20 percent by 20, 30, 35. Now I think earlier you saw in, the, in that uh, film that was <coughs> presented, certain uh, figures relating to Thailand. Now it is somewhat similar, you see 1950 if you look at the pyramid, you know we had a large base where that means that the younger child population is high and then gradually that gets decreased and the working age population increase in 2010. By 2030 the bulge in the middle indicates that you know there are more of working age population and <coughs> that's what happened by 2050 not only the working age population but the older age population also will increase. I think that is a very important uh, aspect to be borne in mind. <coughs> so now, this is what is called the demographic transition. Change from a regime of high fertility and high mortality to low fertility and low mortality. For example, so the fertility rate, you will see how it has declined. It was six, per chil <coughs> six children per woman in 1950s. It has now come down to 2.3 children. Similarly, the infant mortality rate, which is 165 per thousand population, 50s has come down to 50. And life in expectancy has increased about 4.5 times. You will uh, see in this figure, this gives you IMR, that is infant mortality rate, you find a steep decline, whereas life expectancy has uh, gone up. <coughs> so now we come to the question of demographic dividend. You know, with this kind of population, what is demographic dividend? Demographic dividend essentially refers to the rate of economic growth due to rising share of the population in the working age group. So that is where we, no, we are now strong and our working age is increasing and therefore we say India has <coughs> this uh, demographic dividend. And as I said, you see <coughs> the relative size of other age groups declining, especially at the lower level. So it's the intensity of economic activity will increase. <coughs> and as I said, the bulge in the working age structure, that is what creates the economic opportunity or the <coughs> dividend part. But how we are able to make use of this dividend is a different question. Now this is the age structure transition. <coughs> Stage 1 indicates that is a decline in mortality rate and uh, increase in the young population. Stage 2 fertility decline and stage 3 is the old age dependency increases. I mean, we are also moving towards that. <coughs> this you will find, you know, the just a graph about how the <coughs> age uh, group. Uh, <coughs> so 15 to 59, that is the top one. You will find it is increasing almost till 2050, 2045, 50, and thereafter it will start declining. Whereas, <coughs> of course, uh, 0 to 14 is already uh, declining. 
but above 60 will increase, you know, after 19, uh, the midpoint 50, we will have a very high, an uh, old age population. <coughs> now, what are these factors which contribute to this uh, demographic dividend? Essentially, <coughs> it is classified into two categories. One is called the accounting, the other is called the <coughs> behavioral aspect. Now, accounting is that, I mean, you take into account the, the increasing adult population and in economic terms, the saving that will accrue because of the working population. <coughs> and behavioral factors, you know, there are many. I mean, this is where I think India has a lot of problems, particularly the participation rate of women and how real, reallocation of resources takes place. And also, I mean, to what extent are there incentives to save? This <coughs> now, this gives you an idea. See, India actually is, is a country where the saving rate has been good. So we, we, in general, you know, from a long time, as you know, for centuries, Indians have uh, the tendency to save money. I mean, even before banking industry came in, you know, at home, you know, our households, the practice has been we always put something behind for the rainy day. So, I mean, it is uh, it's about 25, more than 25 percent, 2009, 10, there is a slight decline, but still, you say, it's, uh, we have, our household saving rate has been pretty good. Just to give you an idea, one state in Kerala, for instance, I mean, there has been some changes, but you find the rate of uh, saving 95 to $2,000 about more than 47 percent. Maybe, I mean, they do get a lot of money from the Middle East. So that, I don't know when that accounts for it. That is, but a very important factor now I come to is this, what is called female labor participation. <coughs> See, because of fertility transition, you know, women naturally or have more opportunities to engage themselves in work, contribute to work, because number one, you have less children, the time spent in rearing children gets reduced, and you can spend your uh, you know, time in more productive ways. So, one normally expects that the female labor force will increase, or the participation rate will increase with demographic shift. But what exactly is happening, let us see. Unfortunately, the labor force participation rate is not really just a big increase. It's more or less, you know, you know it's stagnant or very, very slight increase that is, that is taking place. This is not only in backward states. This is the interesting part to remember. Even in states which are otherwise, you know, uh, education or literacy is very high in Kerala. Even there, female participation rate is rather low. So it's a very interesting phenomenon. And of course, I mean, you can also say lack of employment opportunities to what extent women are really welcomed in different sectors. I mean, this is another important uh, aspect. Now, this will give you an idea of the uh, work participation of females in India, how it has been uh, <coughs> going up. See, interestingly, again, it is in the rural areas where females work more, more than the urban areas. It's almost double. See, in the urban areas, it's uh, only about 15.5 or let us say 16, whereas in rural areas, 30 percent. That is because of most of the women do work on the fields. You know, that's, that's agricultural work, agricultural labor. A large extent is contributed by women. <coughs> so that is uh, an important. Now, this will give you an idea of across states, you will find that, uh, you know, you see, if you look at uh, down Kerala, Kerala is very poor. This is just 0.3, and even if you come down to 2011, because the last column is just 0.31. Whereas, you know, Bihar, which is considered very backward, it is 1.56. Uttar Pradesh, 2.54. Bingo. Maybe because their people are, women are forced to work for livelihoods. You know, whereas in advanced states like Karnataka, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, and all that, uh, even if women are educated, not all of them go for work. Even in urban areas, you know, there are so many, or you may work for a couple of years, suddenly withdraw yourself, you find uh, even, <coughs> even, even for instance, technically qualified women also don't really all day, uh, enter the labor force or it's very temporary. So this is uh, an important uh, aspect. Now I come to a very, this is another important thing, you know, we have been speaking about the productive workforce. I mean, we, we think that once the, <coughs> the demographic transition has taken place, uh, there are a lot of people working, <coughs> engaged, very actively. But we should also look at 
the question of aging in India. This is going to be an extremely uh, difficult problem to overcome in a country like India. Uh, you see, 50 plus population, which is around 16 percent now, will keep growing up gradually and in 2050 it will become, let's imagine one third of the population above 50 and 65 also, I mean about 14 percent, 80 plus 3 percent. So how are we going to provide, uh, on, the one, one, on the one hand, you know, call it a you know, safety net for the people, the age of population who may not be able to work, who, who become dependent, dependency ratio. But at the same time, I have another important thing to say. You see, all those who retire, let us say, are not necessarily unhealthy or inactive. I mean, they have the capacity to work. Today, that is another big problem I find, you know, given amongst my colleagues and all that. You know, in government service, because in universities you retire at a certain age. You know, in, in, in the government, in state government here, it used to be 55 years retirement age, some years back, say, when I entered the service. And uh, it was again 58 for central government services, in all India services, etc. when I entered. Sorry, I lost. And then uh, I think it was towards the end of 20th century, 98 or so, they made it 60, even for us. Of course, I think in the university, 65, maybe here. I don't know, what, whatever it is. But as soon as you retire, uh, you know, it is not that you suddenly become old and you want to sit at home. So one of the biggest problems, challenges today, I would say, is to provide some kind of, whether you call it employment or some activity to people who retire. I mean, because if you sit idle, there will be more problems, especially at home. You can, suddenly you retire and you find even the women or the wife, they will not like it. They will say, say, what are you doing at home and from morning to evening, you're a nuisance. So <laughs> sometimes, you know, we, we, it happens, we do turn out to be nuisances. So, <coughs> How are you going to tackle the you know, aging uh, uh, issues along with the diseases also? I mean, so this is uh, uh, people naturally you start getting certain some disease or the other. So medical expenditure will go up. Uh, sometimes they'll say we don't have the money even to medical expenses. So that is that is another thing. How many have you know? How many get pension? Only the government uh, people. An informal sector, you can imagine, it is, it's an extremely difficult uh, statement for them. And on the other hand, you find medical expenditure going up. I mean, the cost of <coughs> medical treatment. I mean, in this, you find you go to any private hospital, it's extremely difficult, even for middle classes, let alone the poor. So this is going to be one of the big challenges. Uh, <coughs> this is the same thing, just to give you an idea. <coughs> The another important aspect is in India, you see, it's a, as all of you know, it's a highly heterogeneous country with <coughs> different, uh, not only in, in terms of regional variations, as we saw in the question of female participation, across states, you know, they are uh, um, very well advanced states in terms of economic development, backward states, regional differences, even within a state. For instance, if we take Karnataka, the southern part of Karnataka certainly is more advanced than the northern part, especially northeast. You know, if you take uh, Gulbarga and all that, what, what we call Hyderabad Karnataka region, uh, that has always been a backward region. Now, of course, without some special status and all that. But for long years, you know, I, by going by my own experience, see, I used to be deputy commissioner of the Raichu district. So, as soon as I became DCA, tried to look at the you know, the usual figure some data or statistics about where I should stand in terms of uh, <coughs> population, you know, in backwardness. I found Raichur was at, uh, at the last district in terms of uh, many literacy, health indicators, etc. So those days, you know, again, population was still, you know, growing and we are not talking about demographic dividend. It was in early 70s. So I thought, uh, you know, again, uh, so the question of population or the family planning used to be an important subject those days, you know. And even in the government, family planning programs were administered. Uh, so a lot of people were encouraged to use family planning techniques and all that. So I remember that I organized the first uh, mass family planning camp in Karnataka those days, you know, in, in Raichu. Where, of course, there then used to be mass camps for sterilization. A period of two weeks, three weeks, one year, you do thousand, ten thousand, and all that. 
spiritually only later when people became convinced about the importance of family planning you know family planning came to be adopted and now we find a gradual decline in the growth rate but otherwise those days it's extremely difficult to convey or communicate the importance of family planning to the people especially in the rural areas that is uh, and we all know what happened during the emergency sanjay gandhi's thing and all that so <coughs> So India is heterogeneous, as I said, in terms of uh, not only you know, economic development, language, the diversity that we have, caste, community, religion. All these play an important part in 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 family welfare, as such. You know, on the <coughs> importance of and these demographic indicators vary hugely across states. Uh, this is the ratio of working age, non-working age population. Uh, you will find again here. This gives a good indication of the development strength. So at the top stands uh, Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu more than two, and only Kerala and Tamil Nadu are the ratio of working age population is high. And then you know, you know it declines. We are at a very very low stage. <coughs> so now this is just a background to the entire <coughs> you know scenario about demographics in the country. and the working age population aging heterogeneity female participation rate these are the important factors that go into demographics now what are the challenges before the country I and mean, that's uh, what i think we need to discuss in a seminar like this and so demographics is a dividend or disaster if it is dividend it is dividend if it really contributes to economic growth and if it doesn't then it becomes a disaster so we need appropriate policies to boost economic growth so policy choices becomes extremely important it has been estimated that demographic dividend of 1% gdp growth compounded year by year if the working age population is productively employed i think this is the key productive employment of people as i said retired people they can be productive but they may not Uh, have they may not have the opportunity to contribute to production why why are we about apart from the people in the higher age group even if it is youngsters so what is the employment situation in the country today i mean we are told about 80% of the engineering graduates are unemployable so soon after you acquire an engineering degree professional degree spending quite a lot of money you know lakhs of rupees you find that either you don't have a job or you don't fit into your job so you are not contributing you 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 are in a productive age but you are not able to contribute to production i think this is 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 a great challenge and a challenge uh, <coughs> to all i mean especially even to the education sector i would say i mean why are our uh, engineers Uh, unemployable, or, or even in certain other sectors, I would say, to what extent are they really? They uh, do they reach the standard they are expected to reach? It is a, it is a, it is a an irony that you know India may produce the largest number of engineers, doctors, etc., but so many of them go abroad, go to the U.S., U.K., etc., and there they earn distinction. They are able to. Uh, recently, I read a report. Uh, I think just a couple of days back in the United States, you know, every year they there is an academy, U.S. Academy for awarding White House fellowships. The White House, that is the president, president of the United States, <coughs> they select the best uh, 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 persons contributing to innovation. I think it's called Innovation Fellowship or Innovator Fellowship. The latest in nine two thousand fifteen, I think they awarded. 200 such white house fellowships of which 20 were indian of indian origin so innovators that is 10 percent 10 percent of the awardees or the talented people belong to indian indian origin i mean that's like right, whatever it is whereas the percentage of indian population in the us is uh, less than 1 percent I mean, whatever point is one person let us say so the same person you know we might have even got a degree in you go there do ms phd etc etc and you are able to innovate 
contribute to innovation and win an award. The same person, we are not able to do it here. I think this is a serious question to be answered. How are we, what is, what is the type of education we provide and is it rote learning or whatever it is. The creativity part, you know, this is a, how, do, how do we make people, the youngsters, today I think they are all very smart, intelligent. But do they find the right environment in which their own talent, their creativity can flourish? I think that is the key question. I remember the great scientist Einstein used to say, I mean, he was, as you know, as a teacher, professor, etc., physics. He said, I do not teach my students. I create the conditions in which they can learn. I think that is the challenge before educational institutions. How, how, how can you create that environment? Because on their own, they can come up with all these inventions, etc. It's mostly individual creative mind. But are we providing the conditions? I think that is uh, one of the biggest challenges before <coughs> does. And as I said, if we do not provide the right conditions, the right policies, there will be more unemployment, underemployment, and hindrance to economic growth. Another uh, important development in India, both in terms of demographics and in relation to uh, development in general and even the quality of life is urbanization. So the urban growth that is taking place across the, across the globe. Today, more than 50% of the people in the world live in urban, urban areas, but 3.6 billion. <coughs> so in India, although the rate of urbanization is low, it is just 32% now, 31% in 2011, but in terms of uh, numbers, see today we have 420 million people living in urban areas in India. 420 million, yeah, which is more than the population of the United States, uh, plus some other UK uh, or whatever it is you can call. So, <clears throat> so, and there is a lot of migration taking place. This is also an important aspect of demographics. The movement from rural to urban areas, the migration from very small towns to larger towns to bigger cities. So, this uh, urbanization acts in two ways. It is certainly a very, very powerful positive force because it contributes to economic growth. And <coughs> today nearly 60 percent, 57, 58 percent of the contribution to GDP or the economic growth comes from cities. And this will go up to gradually to 70 percent and so on by 2030 or so. So, <coughs> but at the same time, it also contributes in the negative aspect is that, you know, we know in Bangalore we all experience congestion, pollution, the environmental degradation. So the environment is something that has become extremely important now, significant. You know, we talk about climate change and so on and so forth. You know, just again. So, but <coughs> in a country like India, you know, with, uh, whether it is Bangalore or Bombay or Delhi, in Delhi, we know. I mean, the pollution. How they have been trying to tackle, called the called the most polluted city in the world. It's the most polluted cities in, 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 it's in Asia, in Beijing, if you take. People used to have, have masks in order to prevent you know, impure breathing, impure air. So these, this is another sort of a thing, you know, the, another negative aspect. And what has happened is that this is also, in, in the lifestyles in urban areas is also contributing to large number of diseases. As it is said, India is in a peculiar position in relation to health. I mean, it is, you have both the rich man's disease and the poor man's disease. Poor man's is the communicable diseases, you know, all that, and water, lack of safe water, sanitation, all these things. But at the same time, you have the um, rich man's disease, diabetes, and BP, hypertension, and this incidence is increasing. I mean, that is the sad part of it. We have the largest number of diabetes patients in the world, about 9 or 10 million. And almost any any chronic disease you take, hypertension is increasing. Uh, what is more tragic, in my view, is the. Uh, it's not merely physical disease, but if you look at the mental state, I will not say mental disease, cases of depression, among students. I mean, this is this is the most shocking thing. Why why is it so many students committing suicides? Mainly techies. 
I find you know, a lot of this, uh, not only suicides, murders, killing wife, husband, plotting with somebody else. So why are these things happening in the universe? So I think we need to very seriously address this question of what ails the youth of the country. Maybe it is again related to lack of uh, proper employment, <coughs> whatever it is. So the, all these put together can present a very you know, bleak scenario you know, where you know, fragility, failure, is it failure of the state, is failure of institutions, I would say certainly I think institutional failure starting from political institutions like the parliament or the legislatures on one hand, many educational institutions, I am sorry to say this, I mean people here, students, are, you are all very lucky that you are studying in Jain University. After all, how many such universities are there in the country, one Jain University, one Christ University and a few others across the country. But majority of the people, students, study in government colleges, government schools, in rural areas. I mean, imagine uh, that with the type of teaching that is, comes out there, I mean, you get people, graduates are churned out with poor quality, who are either not employable, cannot find jobs, and adding to not merely you know, the economic problem of employment, but also giving rise to social tensions. Social tensions, you know, violence today we find, whether it's in universities or anywhere else and <coughs> across the country. Uh, so, so, you see, this is all this, uh, uh, how are we going to <coughs> really utilize this opportunity of demographic dividend, as we call it? Ultimately, that is the final question. The demographic dividend, you can reap dividend if you use the opportunity as well. And this is my last slide. What is critical to demographic dividend is number one, human capital. We have human beings, I mean, the, the resource, the human resource we have. So we have to invest in education, in skill development today. And that is why I mean, some of these big programs announced by the Prime Minister whether you call it <coughs> make in India. What exactly does it mean? That means, you know, you are not using our own, you know, labor force to do things which we can do. Uh, like for instance, you know, China was able to do in the manufacturing sector. So we, we missed that manufacturing uh, revolution and now we are trying to reinvent and see whether we can make our own toys and TV uh, <laughs> gadgets and all that. What a pity that China should be making toys of our gods. I hope if you go to the market, you will find Ganeshas and Ramas and Krishna made in China. <laughs> so this is the trouble. So not that we can't make, we seem to have lost our own tradition. In Chatham Patna was known for its dolls, beautiful dolls. Why are we not able to you know, make it as, as marketable as China can? I mean, that, that is the <coughs> the question. So human skill, we need to invest a lot, not merely in terms of money, as I said, using it in terms of for improving quality of education and health, of course, as, as I said, that is the extremely important, related to education, the type of uh, upbringing. So health is wealth, as I say, healthier is wealthier, whatever it is. And finally, I would say, yes, governance is extremely important. We need to reform our institutions. As I said, educational institutions, political institutions, administrative, whatever it is. And of course, certainly make use of the technology that we have today. Everything, everybody is talking about technology. It is internet and uh, 300 million Indians are using the internet, 35 million using uh, smartphones. So we have the capacity, we have the capability. Indians catch up very quickly with technology. But uh, I think the big challenge before is, is how we can <coughs> convert this energy of the Indian workforce into something productive, something useful, which will contribute to the economic and social development of the country. Thank you. Thank you for those thought-provoking words, sir. Your speech has given the necessary insights on the main theme of today's conference, and it has laid a foundation for the rest of the sessions to follow up. I request Professor Nasreen from Department of Commerce to deliver the word of thanks.
It's my pleasure to give the vote of thanks for the inaugural session of this two-day international conference on demographic dividend or disaster. <coughs> this conference would not have seen the light of the day without the support of Dr. N. Sundarajan, <coughs> Vice Chancellor, Jain University. Thank you, sir. We thank Dr. Sandeep Shastri, Pro Vice Chancellor, Jain University, Dr. N. V. H. Krishnan, Registrar, Jain University, Dr. Jay Gopal Uchil, Director and Planning Academic, Jain University, for gracing the occasion. Thank you, sir. I thank Dr. E. Ravindra, Chairman of Institute of Social and Economic Change and Chairman of Smart City India Foundation. Dr. Sari Machila, Professor from Finland. Thank you, ma'am, for having me here. Professor S. Subramanian, ex-RBI Senior Executive and Advisory Board of Studies, Jain University. Mr. Ganegi from Navar. Dr. Nalini Satish Chandra, Principal, Jain College. Dr. Usha Devi. Dr. B. A. Vasu, Director, School of Commerce Studies, Jain University. Professor Lakshmi Narayan, Co-Founder and Chief Learning Officer, I. Nacha. Dr. Manjuna, Controller of Examination, Jain University. Dr. Vinod Kumar Murthy, Academic Head, Financial Services as Business Analytic, I. Nacha. Professor Matthew Anthony, Academic Head, Marketing Leadership and Innovation, I. Nacha. I also thank all the delegate, research scholars, participant, head of various department who have come here and made this conference a grand success. Thank you everybody.